folks, and welcome to the Square D, the Jack the Ripper of GAA Analytics. I'm joined as ever by the irrepressible professor himself, Mr. Stephen O'Mara. Stephen, how are we doing this evening? Not so bad, not so bad. Struggling as ever, but we, we just about got here again. Good, good. Well, listen, cheer up a little bit there. We've a lot to get through. Let's get sparking. Um, Stephen, action-packed weekend, the runners and riders. Um, it's all been settled, sliced, diced. Now, who has finished where? Um, who is getting relegated? And it's also given us a greater picture for how these teams are going to fare out um, in the latter stages of the summer. We're going west for our featured match, Galway and Kerry. Right. Uh, one feature this, Stephen, was, which we're going to get to first up, is a whole matter of Galway's kickouts being a decisive factor into how they're going about their business this year. Talk absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we'll, we'll, we'll get this uh, chart up here first. It's a, a cheap and cheap. Cheerful. I got this uh, few cheap and cheerfuls up uh, at the start. I suppose this took me back. Um, I suppose this took me back to 2018, maybe where in the early stages of the league, I was maybe a bit critical that Rory Lavelle wasn't wasn't getting off um, enough short kickouts. But I think Kerry is really notable because this is the first time in five or six. Or Joyce has had league or championship on Kerry or Dublin, and it's the first time he's won. So for me, it's a it's a it's a really interesting uh, dynamic at play here. Um, that's that's they, they they've beaten them basically. Um, so if we look here, I remember that game of the league in in Tralee, I think it was in eighteen, and there was a goal we had a cluster kick out, and they I just felt Rory was being too conservative, and I I did the equation, which was that. Uh, Galway were making massive profit off short kickouts and they were just breaking even on long kickouts. And I was basically saying, okay, he's being conservative, he's being smart. But when you go to the numbers, there's the value. Galway were profiting uh, 0.4 of a point every time they got a short kickout or 0.35 maybe. Basically three points to every kick short compared to long. And I was basically saying, well, even if you went to the full back line every time and you knew once and four, you'd lose another kick it straight over the bar. That's still three points or one point of the three you get off and one point against, which is ultimately the same as going long every time. Now no one's gonna okay. thank you for <clears throat> no. Stephen Cluxton won't no. get to, won't get all stars for that, but he should have. But if we look here, it's the same story. So So just on that here, slide, right? Yeah, yeah. Just before you go on, right? There's twenty kickouts taken. Now, on all those twenty kickouts, did Kerry attempt a full court press? Or did they concede not, any of those 20? In the set, no. One may be quick, got off quickly. But the key on this, we're going to look at it technically here, is Kerry did press very aggressively in the second half. And maybe it was more, sometimes this is organic. It can be because it's a zonal defence breakdown and the men are in place already as opposed to a quick transition where you can't press generally. But there was certainly five, five at least, probably six, I'm going to say, where they had to be earned. And we're going to look at this because on the seven that Galway have got short, they've scored three points. That's 0.43 per point, okay? On the 13 long, they've scored one, conceded three. That's a deficit of 0.25 points per long kick. So the difference between going short and long, total difference, 0 0.67 per short kick. Out. So you're saying every time Galway goes short, in that game, these are slightly extreme figures, but in that game, they're 0 0.67 points better off than when they go long. Now, I've written implied difference because the key, I don't want to overcomplicate this, is yep. what happened on the first turnover. Uh, that implied difference accounts for if Galway conceded on the turnover or if they lost a long kick out and still scored the turnover. Ultimately, when you get to the actuary, I don't need to bore you with, it's 0 0.3 per short Okay, kick. But, well, let's get in there and have is, a look. Yeah, let's have a look. What this means is that even if Bernie Power knows he's going to lose one out of every five to the D and it's going to get st kicked straight over the bar, it's still better value to win four short, lose one short. It's still better value than going long. And that was a key point that 
after that analysis, I did an 18 on Rory Lavelle that was brought in. And Rory gave a master class on Dublin in the National League final where he started clipping really ropey ones, dangerous ones, to the D, but he got the ball off. We see here, now this is Bernie Power. I don't know if this is sort of last game in the league, let's put the, the, the sub keeper in, or are they looking at something? But I put on Twitter yesterday, masterclass, and let, let's watch the detail in this. Bernie is, uh, we see his body position, and I always talk as an analyst, the first thing I love to see is a goalkeeper lined up straight behind the ball, because it's easy to cheat. That means you don't mark the corner back to, if he's a right footer, to his right side, uh, and you can cheat space. And again, coaching circles now, that language is, is common practice. But Bernie's not straight, what I call zero degrees. He's actually just, he's maybe 80, 85 degrees. But what does he do? The beauty of that position is he bluffs to go right, draws in Clifford to the apex of the D. What does he do? Turn of the body. And any good soccer player understands that that you turn out that way you can pass to your outside or turn in. If you were gone the other way, you can only pass out. So that's really yeah, no, hang on just on that clip, right? Just on that clip. We, yeah. we have um Kerry man, right? Just on the yeah. middle right of screen, who is on the uh, top of the D um, yes. who is marking himself. Right. Um, he's not within 10 yards of the man. He's meant to be tracking. And then you have the second uh, Kerry footballer in the near shot of the picture who is, again, marking nobody at all. Um, well, the point is they're trying to split because if you count there, there's one, two, three, four, five Kerry in that picture. There's five Galway. Yeah. There's one at right corner back of the picture. So they're trying a 5v6 split. So they're trying to get away with it. And you will get away with this. At club level, you get away with this on loads of keepers. Division 1 yeah. County, not too many. Not too many. But you see, if the guy at the left half forward position is ultimately trying to cheat, he, you know, but he, obviously now we can't, so he has to go. He's moved away from that man on the D because he thinks Bernie Power isn't looking at him. And that and that's the point of showing to the right, clipping to the left. Okay. Now, here's the next one. This is brilliant because it looks for all intents and purposes. Kerry say, yeah, keeper, doesn't know what he's at. He's lined up at zero degrees straight behind the ball. And you see that grey and white. That's his field of vision. That's a diagram I would do as an analyst. There's the keeper's field of vision. Watch the carry number 10 here. He's letting Dylan McHugh out of picture. No coincidence this is a, a Carl Finn man, maybe, because Car Bernie Power tore down Guidor's high press in the 18 all -Ireland, 19 All-Ireland semi-final on this. Um, and Guidor were winning 60% of opposition kickouts coming into it. It looks like Bernie is being cheated. Easy. Lovely stuff. Let the man out to the corner. We'll get our 5v6 or our 6v7 and we'll cheat the man at corner back. Watch him. Still looks just off zero degrees. What's he doing? Niall Morgan's an expert at this as well. Throwing the shapes like I'm going long. What he's actually doing, what do we think? Going long. I'm a guy on the end. I'm getting out to midfield now. He's going long. He's throwing all the shapes, but actually what's he doing? He's getting his footwork right to turn at the last second out into the corner. Now, that might not look like much, but that is absolutely top-class goalkeeping. And ultimately, that was the winner of that game yesterday. Yeah, okay. So, I suppose in summary, um, it was somewhat, I wouldn't say complete dead rubber for Kerry. Um, would they have the same lackadaisical full court press in championship. There's a lot of space out there for the Galway lads on those reels. Um, particularly that last one, irrespective of the goalie's footwork. That's a huge concession of space that the left half forward um, hasn't closed up um, on the man at the back. So is that going to happen in all Ireland final, getting that level of space? Uh, my own personal take was that both teams should have got 100% kickouts off short in the first half of the All-Ireland Final last year. Um, there were boxes of six. You know, all you have to do is bring a seventh man in there, use the numbers. Sometimes both teams had the extra man and he wasn't used. More often than not, they just didn't bring the extra body in. So it's not necessarily a fair comparison um, because Conor Gleeson frequently didn't have the extra man to hit. Um, they may go full court press, they may not. But again, that goes back to 2018 when... 
Kerry's full court press, which was being raved about. They were the first team to bring the 4 4 4. And Galway just waited the field and sent six lads to one side of the field. And now, was, I think, just there was a lot of intricate detail on it. And that tore down got Kerry's aggressive press. So it's not as black and white as that either. Uh, I'd say Kerry okay. are a little bit haunted from that uh, and maybe thinking, well, let's try and keep it at six or seven up top. But ultimately, the value there. But if I was Kerry, look at those figures. If I played Galway, I'd be saying, let's go 4 4 4. Maybe even go 4 5 4 and take our chances of conceding the goal because on those figures, um, you're better off forcing them long than death by a thousand, death by a thousand cuts off the kickouts. Okay, one value based metric that all viewers are now well used to on this show is the expected score. Right, just as a recap, okay, your expected score is when a team gets into shooting range, right, and should execute a point or goal, what their actual tally should be versus what it actually is. Now, in this game, again, we're going to see a pretty extraordinary anomaly on the Galway stats, um, which is actually held through the league in seven matches. Talk to us about the expected score of the opposition against this Galway team and how there is an extraordinary pattern um, which has developed. Yeah. Yeah, now look, there's an element of this may be coincidence, there's an element of it may not be. I'm trying to get those guys off the screen there. Um, an element may be coincidence, an element may be not. Um, but if we see here, um, sorry, the best laid plans, these lads came off the screen earlier when I clicked the button. They're not going for me. Anyway, um, what we'll, we'll see here is that expected score here. Again, Galway have lost, uh, lost on expected score. Um, that's that. That's the basic fact. Now, look, Conroy's shot keeper catches it. That accounts for Galway scoring three points above expected score. Carrier below. Now, listen. As I say, there there's a about a one in nine chance that a given team will have the fortune in a in a, in the league that every team will shoot below expected score. Um, it's closer to you know one hundred twenty eight to one for any given for any given team. So and, and I, I'm I'm conscious here. So we see that there the expected score on this was Kerry sixteen point eight, Galway thirteen point two. Expected score per ten phases Kerry four point two, Galway three point seven. So it's I suppose I just want to give a bit of detail. It's unconscious. I was involved with the backroom team before the last Galway set up, but I'm conscious that Lance might be sitting there thinking he's he's cooking the books here to make Paul and Joyce look bad. So there's maybe three elements here that needs to be looked at. Look, an element of it is luck. De- Donegal shot badly. I went back through that. Good Donegal just shot badly in the second half. And two or three of those were actually frees. Um, so there's no getting around the fact that they were just missed. A second element is definitely good goalkeeping and Bernie Power, as we're going to see, made two really good one-on-one saves here. Connor Gleeson has made some of the other games. So that's obviously a factor as well, which is within Galway's control. Um, what I've got to look at here, and this is, I'm only speculating here, and what you have to understand about expected score is it's not an entirely perfect sign. Um, by any matter of means, it's not an, an entirely perfect science. But what we'll see here, this, I thought this was interesting, this is Johnny Heaney now. When I was working with Galway and I was analysing. I'd have said here, this is a 2v1, Johnny. Just step back. And Johnny Heaney was almost never defensively breached. Now, he may just have only looked over the shoulder and not realised. He, he might take that the Kerry man here is accounted for. But it's actually a 3v2. So as the ball comes through, Kerry have another overlap here. And I'm only offering a hypothesis here that I would say there, if I was doing an analysis there for Johnny Heaney, I'd be saying, Johnny, okay, it didn't seem, it, it looked, like a 2v2 it was a 2v3 so you've got to step back here and then maybe they play it it forces it slow and carry get uncontested shots which are more black and white than expected score now what i need to explain here and this is just a, a hypothesis i've marked this as moderate pressure i always mark if you shoot with the outside of the boot because you've only got time to shoot with the outside i mark as moderate pressure matthew tyranny is not really a factor apart from a scare factor because he's not going to block that shot um but when i say no pressure, moderate pressure, high pressure, or else over blatantly blocking hands or off balance. It's a spectrum, and I suspect maybe to give Galway their their, their fair dues, maybe it's a scenario um, that... Who's kicking what, that? 
Uh, Paul Murphy, I think, but I couldn't swear to that. Uh, it so could he, be he's that... actually kicked that with the outside of his left foot. Yeah. So we right. can't you're say no pressure. You're but yeah, it's not I mean, you're only talking about a margin there. Yeah, like he's but a the margin there of 15 is. yards in. Like, yeah. there is no need to kick it outside your foot from there. Well, there, there is no is. decrease in the angle. It's very I, I, minute. Maybe, maybe it's his fancy. I don't know. The point I'm making here, just to account for the fact that it may be complete co- Galway have been blessed. Lucky. Or there could be an element that a lot of these shots I've marked as moderate are on the extreme element of the moderate scale and nearly are, are high pressure. That's something I'm putting out there as a maybe. I need to go back to wherever you shot. I'm not going to do it because this is only a fanciful analytics idea. Um, I'm only putting that out there as a possible third reason why seven out of seven Galway opposition have shot below expected score. As I say, if this game is nearly accounted for for the two goal shots, both being saved. Again, if one of those goes in, it's 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 marginally off. So Porrick Joyce is a lucky general. It could be, as I say, it could be more to do with the fact that they're creating shots that don't fit nicely and evenly into my, as I say, it, 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 over all the league games up to the round five, my expected score was 1.2% out, which is more or less bang on because you're not going to get it perfect without millions or hundreds, at least thousands of, a good few thousands of phases. So it is accurate, but there could be nuance within it that Galway produce more opposition shots that are on the higher end of the moderate scale that I could nearly as quickly have been marked as high pressure. I'm only giving that as an explainer. That's only for the stats nerds, really. Uh, the football people are going to switch off here if we don't go back to more technical football. Okay, so let's go to Galway as an attacking force. Right. Um, and your next decantation is around Galway kicking the ball in. Letting the ball go. Um yeah. Talk us um, through. And again, I suppose we right. look. Yeah. Because I point out again, Donegal, who've had the worst offence in, in the league by a long way, um, they, Galway kicked seven balls into their sweeper uh, and got no return off it. Uh, kicked six, aggressive hand pass on, on a seven. And it probably made Donegal's defence look better than it has been in every other game. Donegal's defensive figures were the best. You asked the question, but Walsh isn't there, Comber isn't there. Now, Galway have essentially come full circle. Like, Paul Joyce came in on a bit of a column of work for two years. Let's take it back to how I won All-Ireland in the 90s and 2001. And we'll kick it in and we'll go straight. We're not allowed to go sideways or back ways. And that's how it looked. And that's the whispers I was hearing around Galway. Um, they've more or less rode back to where it was. Um, but the last thing that is still outlying for me is the fact that they're still kicking ball at the blanket defence. Uh, and by blanket defence, I mean anything with a, with a sweeper in place. Now, I have stats here uh, from the weekend. And you asked me the question about Comer. They've tried nine in this game. Um, and I'm going to break them into two. There's this one here, which is a, you know, this is a missile. Let's knock it over the whole defence. The Kieran Donaghy against Longford and I think it was 06. Now, in this case, ball in. Seamus Derby is still alive and well. Matthew Tierney with a little push in the back, but ultimately got in, slipped where he got the goal shot, but they got a point off it. Now, from the from the six of those, let me just double check my figures here. Um, from the six of those where they've tried to take out the entire uh, zone on the fence, or plus one, they've been turned over on four to score two, 33%. Um, on three that we'll call more dink passes where they've tried to get a 20, 25 yard pass to clear somebody out. They've been turned over on all three. Now, this is one uh, two of the scores, one was an exquisite ball by Shane Walsh to Damian Comer, which probably only Comer would have won, and which goes back to your point against Donegal. But if we look here, here's one in, outside of the boot. Damian Comer, you know, that has to be an inch-perfect pass. Gets there, and it probably it looks like a 50-50. It's probably a 95-5 for Comer. But that was if it's only bad on man. But there's a second carry man there, and it ends up being... being, um, being eaten up by the by the carry man. So the but, but so the point I'm gonna make is, you know, I know Car Paul Joyce came in on a on a on a let's kick the ball at, at all costs ticket and you know and he'd be low to row back maybe. But I, I mentioned this last time about 
that analysis I had from the first league game against Tyrone. Now, here's Galway's phases now. It's a bit messy because that Paul Conroy goal plays with the maths a little bit disingenuously. But from 36 phases, Galway, we've seen this already, got 20 shots, 56%, 16 point, 4.4 points per 10 phases, but 3.7 expected score. If you take out those nine where Galway kicked it in, uh, score two got turned over in seven, it's 27 phases. It's uh, they got off 18 shots. That's 66% shots. They've scored 111, which is 14, and that's 5.2 points per 10 phases. Now, we've still got Conroy's. If I had another half an hour and done the maths on this manually, uh, or 10 or 15 minutes, I didn't have it. I'm guessing that would have put Galway in around 4.4 expected per 10 phases, which would have them at the upper echelon, well over that four average, just shy, uh, well ahead of, of third place, just off Mayo's 4.7 up to the fifth game. And again, I just see that they, they, they started getting men behind the ball. Uh, they've got a, they got they reorganised their defence as of the start of last year. It's really effective. They had the best defensive figures in the league by a country mile on raw score uh, up to the fifth game. Uh, still joined first, taking an expected score. The truth is probably somewhere in between. So the, we're looking at probably the best defence in the game now. We'll look at the individuals on that fairly shortly. Um, but the attack is still only okay. But for me, tear down, kicking the ball into that plus one defence. And I repeat, Kerry won the All-Ireland last year. There's a time for it. There's a place for it for the right guys in the right circumstances. But for me, you had... In the first half against Mayo, I took figures... It was two points from six. Donny Gallup was zero from seven. This entire game is two from nine. Stop doing that. It's going to go back to uh, more drab version than where Galway were at. But ultimately, I think the winner of the All-Ireland is in there. Okay, so you mentioned defensively, right? Um, Galway have quite the X factor in that department. We're going to look at Sean Kelly. And John Daly, um, and I suppose in 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 Premier League terms, if there was a transfer market, uh, these two lads would be fairly high up. The order of merit, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, look. To be honest, the two of them was the whole package. I'm just going to look at one or two other things first, which which leads on to those two boys uh, and Dylan McHugh, because I felt about midway through the second half, their carrier about to take over, and you'll you'll see here. Um, you'll see here uh, Kerry have won a long kick out. this is where Kerry you, you can play a cagey game a, you know a, a possession game whatnot, where Kerry will get you is those few phases where it opens up this is bread and butter for Kerry and you see here they've won a kick out on the break which takes out an extra Galway man and you see they're looking forward open grass this is what Kerry want lovely Kerry kick pass through the centre party clippers going through and we're all thinking the same thing here it's a 2v2. I'll say it's a, a, a 2v1 and three quarters because Dylan McHugh isn't quite there. Now, Clifford could just take the easy option and hand pass it over the bar. But we look here, and this is, again, technically meticulous, made in Corofane defending. Uh, and McHugh here, he's a perfect distance. He, he came from a compromised position. He was slightly off where he'd want to have been. Uh, but he's he's got back. Uh Paddy probably fancied you might sidestep him. I'd say, or else he'd have accelerated. Uh, but watch here, perfect distance. But because his angles and his distance is perfect, it's not as easy for, for Paddy Clifford to sidestep him. Misses the bounce. Now, watch the footwork. The left foot goes out. Now, I'm looking here. I would coach, don't throw that right hand in. But it's actually what a snooker player calls a shot to nothing because he doesn't compromise his balance. He just gives a little swing in case he can get the ball. But watch the next bit. Watch the left foot. Perfect balance. And all of a sudden, instead of Clifford being in for an uncontested one-on-one, -on -one, which is maybe a 1.8 expected score, he's maybe in for a 1-3 a, a chance, uh, a one-point a one expected score. He's under pressure. It's the, the defending is meticulous and brilliant. And note, Bernie Power again. What do most keepers do here, Connor? Uh, that's probably a bit smaller than, than, than we'd like it to be. Uh, but what, what do most goalkeepers do here? They go to ground there. Stays stays on his feet. How many times, if I die tomorrow, I put it on my gravestone. If the keeper had stood up, it would have hit him. 
what does Bernie Power do? He stands up, it hits him. It's top class goalkeeping. Dylan McHugh, Bernie Power, made in Carl Fan, top class technical defending, top class goalkeeping. So you're um you're arguing quite the case here for Bernie Power. Um I know earlier on the programme you mentioned that maybe it's the last game of the league, you run the sub keeper. Um you're you're picking a Galway team tomorrow for an All Ireland final. Does Bernie Power start? Um, abs- ah, absolutely. For me, look, I, I I would have made this argument in 1890. He'd be very unlucky. Um, I mean, essentially, he lost his place to the Galway team by being with Cara Finn, who were busy till the end of the end of March every year. Uh, I, look, Connor Gleeson is a great shot stopper. He's great, great in high ball. I think there's only a handful of keepers in the country who can clip those short clips the way power is. Um, and the shot stop him there. Now it isn't Connor Gleeson, the top class shot stopper as well. The point of that was more Dylan McHugh, just Bernie's on the end of it. Uh, when it comes to kickouts, I think, yeah, for me, Bernie Power is, um, he's just, he's, yeah, has been since I first saw him in 2017, where Galway scored an outrageous 0.7 expected points per, per kickout. Uh, I mean, he put Damien Cobra through on goals from two long kickouts. Um, and clipped a load of short, but yeah, definitely not predominantly the point. I'm looking more at the Galway defense here, but uh, yeah, that for me, he has since I've seen him first in 2017, he is the best goalkeeper in Galway. Okay, well, I mean, look at for every good goalie, he's obviously had, have, has to have good generals in front of him. Um, none better than Mr. Sean Kelly himself, um, and John As Daly. It was. Yeah, well, look, we're going to look at John Daly more as a, a an offensive, though he's a, an exceptional defender as well. But I just, I actually, I, I, I held a rabbit's hole on this because it's it's just so good. And bear with me, there's 17 images to go through here. But I'll do it as quickly as I can. Here's Sean O'Shea, the best high-level, consistent footballer in the country. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we preview the All-Ireland. Uh, um, so you've got the best attacking footballer in the country on the ball. You've got David Clifford, who along with Ian Burke are two standout guys to man mark that manipulate lines, have the balance to do it. La 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 la. This is a really tough defensive position for Kelly in the in the white circle here. Okay. Um but we watch it here. Clifford jinx back once. Okay. Kelly gets the balance perfect. He's gone back now. With Clifford Jenkins, with all the balance, with everything, he's still got face to the man, shoulder for the ball. Top class defending. Clifford now goes across what I call the imaginary line. That's the line between the ball and the back post, uh, or the goal, but the back post specifically. Uh, This is the most difficult thing to deal with for a man marker. Clifford manipulates it incredibly. The best, as I say, one of the two standout players in the country for doing this. Um, Kelly... Forwards union, third away. This is a skill. Watch how he grabs the shoulder. Now, typically he shouldn't turn his back here, but he's on the best mover in the country, so I'll forgive him. Watch a little grab on the shoulder. Split second, just enough to throw Clifford off his balance when he was ready to take little hand pass. What does Clifford do? Does he give up? No. Back, bounces back again. Now, Sean O'Shea has taken the ball into the most difficult technical position to man mark. Ball is behind you. Kelly's angle is maybe 10% off, but again, I'll forgive him. Uh, shoulder to the ball, face to the man, or somewhere in between, which is what he is. Clifford moves again. What have we got? His angles are so good, Clifford's not in a position to shoot. As he bends down, pressure exerted, Kelly turns him out. Second man, turnover. It's exquisite defending. Uh, it's absolutely uh, the top, top notch of defending. And I could have shown other examples. But if it, if it's shown a video, you'd see it better. Um, but it's just absolutely, and you've got, I suppose, comparing Power Joyce to Kevin Walsh, the, the conundrum, the, the difference there is that um, Kevin Walsh had a full back line of savage defenders who probably weren't as good a footballers as the rest of the Galway team. Certainly two of them. Joyce has brought in uh, God, for footballers. And it was a master stroke to put Sean Kelly from wing back to full back. Uh, master throw because he's not because he's still getting up the field nearly as much and effectively three key line breaks for scorers during the game which everybody spotted I don't need to go into that but he's also man marking David Clifford out of the game but again the key point I suppose is Kelly 
was in with Kevin Wall. There, there, there's four outstanding technical coaches in Galway that I know of, and uh, that I know of the country, the four of them are in, are, are in Galway. Um, Kevin Walsh is one of them. And he would have had Kelly in 18 and 19, Daly in 19, and um, Dylan McHugh was Cara Finn. They're technically the best coach, in, in, uh, one of those coaches up in Cara Finn as well. But these guys have been schooled by the best. These Those three, Dylan McHugh, John Daly, Sean Kelly, have been schooled by the absolute best defensive coaches that I know of. Now, I'm not familiar with every coach in the country, but the four exceptional ones, those lads would have had in, in Mount Bellew and Mike Cullen uh, in the case of um, Daly and Kelly and McHugh in Cora Finn. So there's three outstanding defenders there. But to, to move on on John Daly and, uh, uh, you know, a key stat, when John Daly came in in 19, like I would spot with a naked eye and I would get the numbers then to prove it for myself. Kieran Kilkenny, first time I saw him, I says, I know his team are scoring more or just incredible. Uh, you know, I, I haven't done the numbers on Matthew Tierney, but I strongly suspect it. Um, the first time when I started studying Throne, uh, Kieran McGeary would have jumped out at me and Matty Donnelly would have jumped out at me. I was correct. John Daly went with Galway my, when I was there in 19. Galway were scoring one and a half times more when it went through his hands compared to not. That's a centre back. He should be below average. 1.5. And actually, I hadn't... I, 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 yeah, so yeah, solid solid defender. Uh, but nothing amazing, I would have said. Uh, or, or, or footballer. But you run the figures. And then it was after running the figures, you go back and you look at the hows and the whys. And I'm just going to show you uh, an exquisitely intelligent piece of football. Because... He does something here that I'd say maybe 1% of the footballer in the country would do. Man running down the right farm, okay? What does everybody here think to do? That's an open-ended question for you, Connor. What What are we thinking here? Man off the shoulder. He's got the overlap. What are we thinking of doing? Pop the pass. Pop the pop pass off to him. Pop the pass. And you'd be tearing your hair out if you didn't pop the pass. No. Daly's vision is so good. He sees... That is actually accounted for down the road. So I'm only kicking the potential for the line break down the road. And if we go further down, yeah, it's still man on man. We have to semi compromise. It's still man on man. But we're not going to get the overlap. What does he do? What all smart players should do. He takes it at 45 degrees and he takes it further on down the line for Galway to attack more efficiently. You see, Daly goes right at 45 degrees. I think it's Dylan McHugh again, Cara Finn. Uh, th this will be their bread and butter. Left at 45 degrees. I think it's Dylan. I could be wrong. Next man then, whether he likes it or not, is dragged in at 45 degrees. And Matthew Tierney's out here on the line. He's on that yellow. And then he comes across. Kerry don't get a hand on anybody. And it's over the bar. And it's an exquisite piece of offensive play. But the point is, it's all created by John Daly. And one of the enigmas I see in football is some... One day a team are brilliant. And there's an example in my head, I won't give it, um, where a team are doing brilliantly and then one day they're not. And you look, may the centre-back change. Graham Canty coming off the bench against Down in the 2010 final. Is the, that, if you want to learn about football, watch that game. Watch how poor Cork are running in straight lines before Canty comes on and how little they score. Canty comes on, it all turns. But it's not Cork, it's Canty because he's forcing all these runs, all these moves. John Daly, Graham Canty, for me are the two outstanding offensive centre backs in my adult life. The figures bear it out. That's the example. We're going to move on, right? Um, speaking of greatness, um, obviously, if you polled, I would imagine ninety nine percent of the GAA population as regards to who is the best player in the country, they would say David Clifford. You're going to explore this. In a little bit greater detail. Yeah. Um, I disagree thoroughly. I think David Clifford is possibly at this moment in time the most talented, raw, uncut diamond in the country. But the figures just don't stack up for me. And I was going to hold this off for the for the championship preview and it's important to point out that the David Clifford I saw in the All-Ireland final and semi-final last year looked like a new man who'd been coached by somebody new 
I felt maybe Paddy Talley had an input, but I believe he was a defensive coach, so I don't know. Clifford was frugal. He didn't hit low percentage shots. The shots he hit all sailed over. Maybe it was one wide or one turnover. But I suppose the first image I've got to look at here um, is, and I suppose, and we're going to go into, in, into some figures on this. Um, I'm going to ask you here if, If somebody on Jim Gavin's Dublin team hit a shot like that, what do you think would happen? Blocking well, hands, narrow angle, slightly off balance. What do you think Jim Gavin would do? I know what he'd do. What do you think he'd do? Well, interestingly enough, <clears throat> Dermot Connolly um, did something similar. Well, you're you're two steps last, ahead of me. Go on. <laughs> the last kick of the game. Um, and he started the next match. So... I have a feeling Clifford would start the next match as well. Um, if it will. was someone, if it was Darren Moynihan who kicked that ball, right? Or well, let me ask you a question: other. If Darren Moynihan had sixteen significant plays and lost the ball on eleven, would he start the next day? Should he start the next day? No. If David Clifford did the same, Even... should he start the next day? No, even the manager's son wouldn't start the next day. Well, I'm going to get... There's another low percentage shot over blocking hands now. I'm going to give you some stats. And I'm not taking away from this guy's raw talent, but people saying to me, or me here on TV, this is possibly the greatest player ever already. I absolutely could not agree with it. Um, and it, it's, it's absolutely void of analysis. Um, and here we are. Here's now... I need to do a fuller, a fuller description, a fuller analysis on this, okay? Um, because I will say sometimes what I call these the significant touches on the day. Now, sometimes what people think are significant touches are what people don't think significant touches are. But here's what I have marked as a significant touch. I not just get the ball and hand pass it back or stretch the field rotten. Negative, there's eleven. Man marking losses, i.e. ball played into him that Sean Kelly came up and won the ball three. Now, in fairness, two of those, the ball wasn't amazing. They're kicking them into Clifford because it is Clifford. So that's a bit open for interpretation. One, definitely. Two, you might mark on Clifford. You might mark on the kicker. Four turned over by Clifford. Two wide, two short attempts. That's 11 turnovers on David Clifford. Um, I've never seen that from other county players. Uh, in a single game. Um, and I see this with high-end players, that they do exquisite things and people remember them, and they just forget all the all the negatives, positives we have here. And this is key. He did get four assists, which is really significant. He gave an assist for a shot that was hit wide, and he gave a secondary assist. Um, so I'm going to say there were five points there was four points. Now, one of those short attempts incidentally ended up in a carry hand. So I'm compensating there for the assisted wide. Five points from 16 significant touches from Clifford. That's 31% went through Clifford's hands and 38% when it didn't. Now, if that was a midfielder, you'd be saying all things being equal, uh, you should be it should be equal both sides. Forward should be at 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, higher than the average. And here we have the tallies man inside forward um, kicking. It's 31% without and 38%. Sorry, it's 38% without and 31 with him. It absolutely does not stack up. Um, and this isn't a one-off. Against Tyrone the last day, of what I marked as eight significant plays, six turnovers are wides, two points. And actually, as he turned and tried to hit, a screamer into the top corner on the back foot from the edge of the box instead of tapping it over the bar, and 99% are over the bar. Marty Morrissey exclaimed, isn't he, isn't he majestic? Isn't he amazing? And I think, I'm passing over the bar. It was a 20% shot. For me, I think he's an uncut diamond. I think he can be as good as Dermot Connolly and Colin Cooper uh, in raw ability. Uh, and Connolly, there, there's a mathematics assignment on Connolly. But for me... Dublin had two David Cliffords, guys who shot those. And there was value in them, 
when teams were scoring two out of ten phases, that bit of magic rabbit from a hat to bring you to 30, 35% was brilliant. But when the possession game came in, now you're looking at averages of four out of every 10. A guy hitting 31% is an absolute liability. And Dublin had two of them. And this is going to offend your Vincent soul to its core, Connor. One was Dermot Connolly. The other was Bernard Brogan. And people are looking for the big story. What happened with Gavin and Connolly? I'll tell you what happened. He was kicking too much ball away. And so was Bernard Brogan. And Dublin won a number of that six in a row. I think did Brogan start consistently for the first two, maybe three, not the last three or four. Connolly, who knows? My sense is Gavin told Connolly, no, you can't be kicking this much ball away. Now, for Vincent's against Ballymun, when you were in a game where it was two out of ten was being scored on average, except when it went through Connolly's hands and he hit, I don't know, I think you were at that game. He scored five of the 11 points Vincent scored. Four for anybody else were once in a lifetime. They were the points of Shane Walsh and David Clifford kill, kicked to the all or the final after messy like slaloms through John Small and James McCarthy. But it ceased to be value for Dublin, in my opinion, except in broken field play in the second half when the field was more loose. I think so David could this... Clifford, could this be a case of the, the cute Kerry man not showing his hand in the league? No, know, because limping. the figures were the same. Because the figures are not a million miles removed of the 2019 dollars in the final, which I'll go into in more detail. And the point I make, why I've shown the assists, and there's two reasons why I've shown the assists. Number one, it would be remiss not to. Uh, I'm not trying to do a hatchet job here. I'm, 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 I'm not slagging this guy. I just think, as I say, if, if you came out to me tomorrow and said, Niall Scully is the best Gaelic footballer in the history of the game. I'd have to say, hold on there a second now. He's bloody good. He's exceptionally effective. He was a brilliant cog in a Jim Gavin wheel, but the best ever. So I, I feel it shouldn't be any different. If the data and the analysis is absolutely wrong on David Clifford, I don't think I'm having to go. I, I, I think it's fair to point out, no, he's a raw diamond who needs coaching on not hitting low percentage shots, not hitting low percentage passes. And what he could do, if you look at his four assists, he's the same thing on all four of them. He wins the ball. He uses his exquisite, exceptional balance, drops the shoulder, and hand passes the ball 10 yards down the road to someone who pops over a 70, 80, 90% shot. And if he would do that, like King Khan, Kerry would start winning moral Ireland. So I assume... Judging by this reaction, you don't have any pre-booked holidays down to the Kingdom of Kerry anytime soon. I um, think they might be thanking me in seven years' time if they take this on board and they've won their, their seven in a row. Okay. Well, listen, that is some very, very challenging rhetoric there. Um, hope everyone enjoyed that end. We're just going to wrap, right? We're going to go up to the Tyrone Arma. Um, the best of friends, just as a finito, right? Um, this is a game our man had to win to save their bacon against their lovely neighbours, Tyrone. Um, and obviously, Tyrone would be heartbroken if poor old our man got relegated, as they often are, you know, when such misery comes to the door of their beloved our man brethren. Um, Talk us through this one. Give, just give us a look at the stats there briefly on this. Yeah. Well, again, I, I'm basing this off what I've come to that four out of 10 av uh, average and saying that when I had five games done, Tyrone actually had marginally the second best offensive figures in the league. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, it was 4.1 or 2, 4 being the average. Their issue was the defence was what was 4.7 concession per 10. Armagh were bang on in around the four on both, if I'm not mistaken. And I've looked at it. Look, I've looked forensically at both of these defences uh, and at our at Tyrone's offensive play. And I suppose we look here, ultimately, I suppose this game, um, if you look, it's a real Ulster game. I, also, I, I mean, good, intelligent, sound, processed. Uh, don't give the ball away football. Uh, only, only 62, 61% phases with shots, but. The expected score for 10 phases is above four for both of them. Four, six, Tyrone, four, two, Armagh. Uh, but, you know, the expected score per shot, 70% for Tyrone, 63% for Armagh. And in a tight game, that's ultimately what, what won it. They both shot slightly above expected score. But that's a lovely, that's a really lovely uh, 
shot map for Tyrone there, and most have gone over. And you see, uh, have I lost our Mars? I have lost our Mars. I had it. Uh, it's gone, I think. Let me have a quick look down the road here. Sorry, there's our Mars shot map. So they're both really tidy, tidy shot maps. Um, but ultimately, uh, our Mars scored more. But what what really swung this Tyrone. game... Sorry, sorry, Tyrone won. What swung this game ultimately was the fact that... Um, throw one more kickouts, uh, and when you look at these at a glance there doesn't look like there's a huge amount of difference because our have lost seven there and you can see Tyrone have only lost six but actually Tyrone have a lot more greens and the key factor in this game statistically speaking was uh, and I suppose the, the big news here is the, is the brown column at the bottom there Tyrone 24 kickouts 118 lost six scored nine off their own and conceded two that's only the first possession so that'll be balanced out a bit if you counted the second possession. But Armagh, 121, sorry, 21, 114, lost seven. So it's it's a 75% ratio versus a 67% ratio. But Armagh have won eight and conceded six. So from the five, from the seven they've lost, they've conceded six points. And that's ultimately getting caught with their pants down on losing kickouts is ultimately what cost them. Uh, and the, the better shooting from... from Tyrone and the fact that Tyrone made serious hay when they won the Armagh kickout. Yeah, I mean, back look, we, we we discussed obviously the importance of David Clifford or lack of importance of David Clifford, right? Reen O'Neill, um, Armagh without Reen O'Neill, have they a snowball's chance in hell of making any impression this year? Um. My personal belief, and I heard people talking about Kieran McGinney's tenure, and I think people forget Armagh were in Division 3 when Kieran McGinney took over. Uh, and I don't really believe Armagh have players to justify the lofty heights they've been at. I think if you put no. the Armagh and the Galway team together, the only two I'm saying are definitely in the Galway team are Reid O'Neill and Jerry Leogburn. Just some lovely footballers, Grugan, Campbell, but they wouldn't they'd be up against Galway guys as good as them, but athletically superior. Um, so Ethan Rafferty, Ethan Rafferty, uh, possibly depending on what way he wanted to play. Sorry, yeah, I was thinking outfielders, um, depending on how he wanted to play, yeah. Um, I think Division Two is probably where, and this is this isn't an so an underhanded compliment to McGinney. I think Division Two is probably where they should be at. I think they boxed above their weight level. I think. Kieran Donaghy added huge amounts when he came in. We're going to look at why that may have evaporated uh, to some extent. Um, without O'Neill, yeah. Well, look, we don't know. I, I, I don't care to get into where he is or why he's not there. But if he's not playing, yeah, I mean, he's the he's the outlier on the team. It's gonna. But look, their figures are still good there against Tyrone, who ultimately finished, I think, fourth or joined third, maybe. Um, so their offensive figure is still okay. It's actually, if we, if, if we can look here, it's, for me, the issue with, uh, with, with Armagh uh, and look maybe I haven't helped this scenario uh, maybe connected or not but uh, I think when I say found out when I uh, yeah look I'll, I'll say in summary I think their defence has been found out um, and when I say found out I don't mean it in the Joe Brawley way you know you win nine matches and they lose one or they found out well you know you won nine um, this last year early on last year Armagh Per 10 phase, the games I have on file, um, they conceded two points, up, up until a red card, they conceded two points per 10 phases against Monaghan, 2.5 against Kildare, who were only marginally relegated. I don't have the figures on Dublin, but I reckon it's below three. Um, now they're up back conceding 4.6 expect, uh, 4.6, 4.2 expected. And I just think, and this is the analysis I showed on them the second week. Um, and again, maybe someone's watching, maybe they've worked it out themselves. Brilliant zone defence, but teams have worked out against Armagh. There's no shot clock. Take it down the channel. Drag the extra Armagh bodies across. You can see there they've two extra bodies on the ball side. Get the ball back out. Get it across. Kick pass. This is the killer for Armagh. You see now there's spare men on the far side. There's an Armagh man out of picture. He goes down the channel again. Straight back out. Another kick pass. This is a nightmare now for boys trying to run across the front of the arc. Now, there's one boy coming across to try and get uh, the 23. You've got Jamar Hall who's facing two different lads. 
nothing he can really do. In they go, handy point. Uh, and I just think, I don't think Armar are doing anything different, but I think everybody else is. And I think probably as effective as that defensive structure was for a year, maybe a year and a bit, I think now it's, it's, it's there. I think people have worked it out. I think it's there for the taking. And I think those figures are going to stay well above that 3.5, maybe that average four could start spiking to 4.5s and whatnot. And then take Reno Neal out. Yeah, it's it's, it's probably concerning times for Armour. That's a wrap. Um, yeah. We're going to leave it there. Um, all to play for. And uh, thanks, folks, everyone, for joining us. And we will see you next week on the Square D.